Today I'm going to talk about, so I have a background in demography and sociology, and I'm going to talk about um, how you can use uh, molecular genetic data or whole genome data, um, but particularly from a social science approach. So I do have to say we're funded by uh, NCRM, our SOCGen project, um, and um, um, that grew out of an ERC project that I had called Sociogenome. So we were doing a lot of genetic research, and I'll show you that from Sociogenome. But what we realized what we were really missing um, was teaching material and actually describing what we're doing and building some um, statistical models that could fit with our sociological and demographic questions. So the MCRM has funded that. We had a summer school last year on molecular genetics and social sciences, and we promised to do one, but uh, we've got about 20 requests uh, about when is it being held again, are you doing it again, so we'll probably hold it again this year too um, because of the, the demand uh, of people asking. We're also producing a textbook, so everything I'm showing you how to do today, um, we're producing a, a textbook that will have a lot of online open source uh, um, information about how to do this. Um, we're very pleased that we have a donation of 9,000 people who've agreed to use, uh, to, we can use their genetic data for the textbook. Um, and I can talk to you a little bit more about um, crowd uh, sourcing genetic data in citizen science if you're interested, uh, because that's another project that we're, we're working on as well. So you'll be able to use that textbook to do some of the things that we're doing today. It'll be open source. You can use actual large-scale genetic data. Um, and I just wanted to say that it's going to be a very introductory textbook. So if anyone's seen my, or me, and, and I'm sure you haven't, but <laughs> if you've seen my uh, in introduction to survival and event history analysis in R, I've written a textbook. And uh, my mother uh, tested the introduction to R chapter. Mm -hmm. She had some problems with the confidence intervals around the bar graphs, but that's okay, you know. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so I just wanted to say that we're, we're we produce things in a very accessible level. Um, uh, my mom's smart, I don't mean it like that, but uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> she's, she's the only one that will watch this video as well. Um, so, uh, um, but, uh, so, so I, I didn't mean it, of course there'll be many people watching it. Um, um, <laughs> um, but uh, we go through things that you often don't encounter when you, so you get this, this large scale genetic data, but, but it's huge. So the UK Biobank is seven terabytes. What do you do with that? How do you download it? You need to, to work with a cluster computer, all of these things. So we have a very accessible sort of introduction about you know, how, do you, how do you make those different steps? Um, because often we get these little mini well-prepared data sets. And uh, so we go through the sort of blueprint thing in the textbook. So um, look for that. I'm not alone. Um, <laughs> I work together with a team. Uh, Michaela has stolen uh, uh, Nicola Barban, who I've worked with uh, for the last uh, seven years. Um, he's now in Essex, but that's great. We're happy for him. Um, but I work together a lot uh, with uh, Nicola for the last years, uh, Felix, and there's many different people in the team. Um, so it's a real group effort. It's also my Brexit slide um, <laughs> to, to show we've got Charlie. Um, so if we don't have freedom of movement, uh, my team will be influenced uh, by this. Okay, so just to say a little bit of a background, and Michaela's already talked about it, but what do I mean by genetics? Because uh, I thought this was more of an introductory um, uh, sort of uh, uh, session, so I'll just back up a bit. And throughout my, my presentation, if you have any questions or comments, just put your hand up and it's really fine. Uh, we, can, we can stop and, and you can ask questions. So I think some of you have heard about um, behavioral genetics. So those are the twin studies. And I'm sure um, you know, some of you have heard of these twin studies. And what they do is they compare um, monozygotic twins that have almost 100% genetic similarity with dizygotic twins. And those are like siblings, so they can share between 40 to 60% of uh, the uh, genetic material. And from that, they try to partition out the variance, so your R squared, or how much you can explain, and how much is related to genes. 
your shared uh, family environment from growing up in the same household or the same neighborhood and environment, and your unshared environment. So things such as your partner or, uh, um, you know, when you move further on in your life and, and uh, a large error term as well. So this is where the field was for very, very many years, and it's a still a very act active field. But I'm not doing that. <laughs> I'll talk a little bit about twin studies. What I'm talking about is molecular genetics. And that's um, uh, where we actually look at uh, the whole genome data. And we look at something called single nucleotide polymorphisms. Um, but in short, we usually call them SNPs. <laughs> and uh, these SNPs um, vary, uh, and, and this is where we examine, um, uh, so we're about 90% uh, uh, similar, but there's on these small um, uh, AGTC variants, we can see these differences. And then what we do is we look at the differences between individuals, but then we want to see, okay, well, what do these genes do? What's the function and the structure of them? So that's the difference between this behavioral genetics and um, uh, molecular genetics. So we can think about heritability of traits, and I'm sure some of you have uh, 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 heard some of these things. So there's, there's a really broad difference in what, is gen what has a genetic basis, and this is based on SNP heritability, so whole genome data. You know, when studies have found, um, you know, what we can see is that things such as eye color, freckles, <laughs> um, height, these are largely um, uh, have a strong genetic basis. But as we get further into complex traits, these are my kids, by the way, um, when we get into complex traits, uh, age at first birth, number of children, type 2 diabetes, BMI, we see sort of larger confidence intervals, but we also see um, a, a difference in a lower um, uh, genetic basis. And we're going to talk about, well, why is that? Um, uh, we'll, we'll continue talking about that. So when I first started entering into this, I thought, you know, why, are we, why am I even doing this? Can we ignore, um, you know, some of this uh, genetic research? And I'm going to say yes and no, actually, <laughs> in my presentation. So uh, maybe you thought I was going to, to uh, talk about all the praises of it, but you'll see towards the end uh, there are some critical uh, sides to this research as well, too. And I think as social scientists, that's kind of why we're here, to really be, have an open mind um, and be critical. So there was a lot of studies in the 90s and the 2000s where they based it on candidate gene studies. And some of you may be familiar with this, and I think it's just important to reflect on it. These were published in major journals in psychology, but also the American uh, Journal of Sociology, Population Studies, some of the major social science journals continued to publish these studies. Um, they were often um, um, hypotheses that were based largely on um, animal models about things thinking about dopamine and, ser and serotonin and, and reward uh, functions. Um, and they compared people that had certain genes with those that didn't, so cer certain genetic loci. It was easily conducted and uh, many of the studies collected about six or ten markers. So this is like at the end of the 90s, beginning of the 2000s. It produced a lot of bad research, and Patrick sort of asked about that, and I'll talk about it a little bit uh, later um, uh, as well, too. So there were these studies that came out. There was a criminologist, Beaver, who found the gangster gene, and that was published. Later, you know, somebody looked, and it's like, well, 40% of the population has that. <laughs> so might not be. Um, and, uh, you know, there's these human warrior genes and aggression genes, and there's been a lot of studies that just haven't been able to be replicated. So I think it's really important when you're surveying the literature and you look at some of these older studies that look at one or two candidate genes, look and make sure, see, have they been replicated? Many have not. Yeah, so, so um, basically it's, a it's like a case control model, and you would see, 
you know, people that, so you look at what they call in genetics a phenotype, what we call a dependent variable or an outcome, and they see, okay, people with, uh, that have the, these genetic markers or these candidate genes have a higher likelihood to be in a gang. So that's what they found, but it was in a very small sample, um, and it hasn't been replicated. And if 40% of the population has that, I mean, we'll talk about gene-environment interaction. Maybe we all have the gangster inside of us, but um, <laughs> it's, uh, you know, and we can talk about that, but that those, those studies just uh, didn't pr uh, weren't replicated. If you're interested, you can look at, there's been more, but Duncan and Keller um, sort of did a analysis of some of these early studies, and they showed that they often focused on, you know, one sort of small set of SNPs, um, they were very selective, so they had selective populations. Um, they rarely replicated, so about 10 replicated, 27 no replication at all, um, and then this one purely negative. So most of the studies, they just could not replicate. They were done on one population, you transferred it, tried to do it to another population, didn't find the same thing. There was also a strong pub uh, publication bias. So, you know, that people have the gene for, or this or that, and uh, that influenced the results. So the field has gone through quite, and you might have heard of this, and people say, oh, that stuff is nonsense. Uh, yeah, some of it is. <laughs> um, and this led, and this is amazing to me, but um, this led the editor of Behavior Genetics in 2012 to say the following. Behavior genetics literature has become confusing, and it now seems likely that many of the published findings of the last decade are wrong or misleading and have not contributed to real advances in knowledge. I mean, I was the editor of European Sociological Review for about six years. Can you imagine if I published that? I mean, it's just, <laughs> it's amazing. It's amazing, okay? So, so the field really uh, recognized, and this is a really high impact top journal. Um, that, uh, you know, so this is a field that moves quite quickly, and it's a field where you're, if you're going to work you know, in an interdisciplinary manner, you really have to talk with the geneticists and understand um, the shape of the field. So social scientists, unfortunately, got a bit of a bad name <laughs> as well uh, for some of these studies. But now there's demands. If you do something, you have to replicate it. In a study I'm about to show you, you have to post your results on open science framework, or your uh, analysis plan on open science framework first, so you don't look like you're fishing, you know? So you post your analysis in advance and say, I'm gonna do this. We have two quality control centers where we both analyze the data separately, and then we come together to, to <laughs> see if we have the same results. It'd be great to do this in social sciences, by the way, but, um, you know, so, so it's a really uh, a much more careful um, analysis now. So why have we avoided this for so long? Well, it has a very dark history when you think about uh, genetics and uh, eugenics, and I think, I always think it's really important to focus on this, and I haven't focused too much on ethics, but maybe we can come to that later in the, in the panel discussion. So, it's got a very long history. And also, I think this was raised in the last discussion, you know, there's been some people that have used uh, uh, genetics as a basis to make some claims. Um, I'm sure some of you have heard of the bell curve. Um, they were arguing that social stratification is based on innate genetic endowment. So that would make um, all of us sort of useless as social scientists because, you know, you'd never have, be able to have a policy intervention if everything's genetic. I hope to convince you by the end of this, but you're social scientists, so maybe I don't have to, uh, that, that not everything um, is, is fully genetic and it's much more complicated. But I also think, and I'm grateful to the NCRM because there's a lack of interdisciplinary training. I mean, how do you even approach this? Um, so that's why we're trying to, to spell it out as well. So we've ignored it because there's an allergy to it for, for good reason, but also because we're just not trained uh, to be able to know how to handle this data. So there's the other side. So I think there are some things you can ignore and some approaches that are not helpful or scientific. Um, but I think there's actually some, some very interesting things um, that we can look at as well. So social behavior and outcomes, things uh, that we study, such as social mobility, educational attainment, um, uh, fertility, which I study quite a bit, well-being, um, we generally study them in relation to this and sometimes this. So 
we think of things and our action, at least as a sociologist, we think of our action and behavior as you know, situated within certain childcare uh, availabilities or laws or contraception regulations or housing markets or, you know, these are the kind of institutional structural uh, things that we think are important and they are important. We also think in terms of choice and, and, and individual characteristics and personality and, and um, uh, drive that individuals have. So we've looked a lot at this. But you know, there's this other side of the literature that argues that there is a biological basis for behavior. And I, I remember, you know, meeting with a colleague of mine who's from genetics, this was ma many years ago, and he said, oh, what do you study? And I said, oh, I look at reproduction, you know, age at first birth and number of children. And he said, oh, that's interesting, I do that too, you know, so we started talking. And by the end of the conversation, he said, you're entirely socially deterministic. You know, you think, and then, and then we went out for some drinks and he, his friends joined and he said, oh, I want to introduce you to Melinda. Um, she thinks that fertility has no biological basis and everybody laughed, huh? Um, you know, so, so, and it was funny. So why on earth, I was looking at reproduction, why on earth had I looked at it in terms of just availability of childcare and work-life reconciliation and all of these things and, and gender equality? Why hadn't I considered, <laughs> particularly with postponement, that there could be some biological factors? And if you look into the literature, it's, it's relatively uh, sparse uh, looking at biology. So one of the examples I'm going to show you um, that I'll focus in more detail is about um, uh, some of the things we look at. So the timing of when you have your first child and the number of children ever born. And I'll talk also about education as well, because that's another study where there's been uh, more uh, genetic work on. So there's been a strong postponement in uh, the age at first birth. This is women's age at mean age at first birth by different countries. So we see, you know, from the 1970s until, um, you know, 2012, and it's even gone up, we see about a four to six year postponement in having a first child. So that would make us think, okay, well, at a certain age, biologic biological and genetic uh, factors may become more important than they have in the past. And what's even more interesting is, I'll show you in a minute, it's, pr it's likely just as, if not more important for men, which we often don't look at. We've also had, if we look from the 1900s to, these are people born in the 1900s to those born in 1970, we see this sort of U-shape uh, which is very interesting historically in terms of childlessness. So this shows the European average, but we see that childlessness, so people that don't have uh, children by the end of their reproductive period, you know, it's up to 25% to or 20% in many societies. And it was also uh, very high as well at the turn of the century. So there's some historical factors, and I'll come back to this too, but there's other reasons to think, wow, do we, why do we have this growth in... Uh, um, people not having children. So if you're interested in, I'm going to talk now about some of the methods. If you're interested in, a, <coughs> I think, an accessible uh, uh, introduction to them, we have a, a short uh, article in, in uh, the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science where we outline some of these um, techniques. So we talk about how we used to do the classic design to twin and family. And now I'm going to move to talk about Grimal methods and polygenic scores from genetic wide association searches. It's always a mouthful, all of them. Okay. Um, I haven't put the mathematics into it, um, but if you're interested in that, we can, I can also give you some sources as well. I just thought it would be nice to have an introductory uh, talk about it. So Grimal is really interesting. This is um, a genetic restricted maximum likelihood estimator, and it's done in a R package called GCTA. Now, basically what this does is, instead of using twin data where you compare monozygotic twins, 100% related, to dizygotic twins, variation in relatedness, it allows you to look at unrelated individuals in a data set to see how much they might be related. So we might be, uh, 55 percent <laughs> uh, related and Gabby and I might be um, 30 percent and it's nothing uh, it, you know we might be 30 percent related who knows you know so so that gives you an idea but we're all in the same data set and then I'm going to talk to you about genome-wide association studies 
And from those, we draw what's called polygenic scores. So does anybody have any questions or things they'd like to ask? Not about these techniques, don't worry. <laughs> OK, just put up your hand uh, if, you, if you want. OK, so. So we, uh, in 2015, we did what's called this Grimal or uh, uh, um, analysis, where we looked at whole genome data from various populations. And we wanted to see what is the heritability of age at first birth and number of children ever born. So let's do some guesses. What do you think the genetic variance explained or the genetic heritability of age at first birth would be? I showed you some of the heritability. Oh, yeah, I kind of showed you a little bit. Oh, yeah. <laughs> For those of you who are paying attention. Um, <laughs> so what do you think? 40%. 40%? Anybody else? 20. 20%? What about number of children ever born? Do you think there'll be a difference between those? So it's when you have your children and the number of children you have? No? Could be some differences. Okay, this is what we found. Ta-da! 15% um, <coughs> of when you had your first child could be s explained by the SNP heritability, and around 10% for number of children ever born. So this seems to be rather high. So we, but remember with the, with the Grimal methods, the GCTA, the analysis we did, we can just say, similar to twin studies, that it might be 15% or 10% heritable. We don't really know what's going on. So this was actually a rather, um, uh, this, this finding got quite a bit of attention because we didn't know that before for these kind of behaviors um, that they would have this high of a genetic basis. So we got all excited. Um, but then the journalists and everybody said, okay, it's 15% or 10%, but what are the actual genes? And do they do anything? So what are, you, what are you actually finding? And I mean, this is where you have to dig a little bit deeper. So what we did is we worked on what's called, excuse me, a genetic-wide association study. So this beautiful graph um, is, it shows all the different chromosomes. And it shows um, where there's been uh, genetic loci located. So on chromosome one, we see there's been all of these different genetic loci located things, oh, it's really hard to see, sorry, things related to cardiovascular disease, um, uh, um, cancer, and everything. So you can see all of these different traits. And to date, there's been about 3,100, so over 3,000 of these genetic-wide studies. So if you see, you know, genes found for this or implicated in that, it's, it's these studies. And they have a catalog where you can look it up and see if there's genetic basis found for certain traits. We have one of these dots now. No, 13 actually. But um, so what is it? It's um, you look across the, the um, human genome, so the whole genome, this molecular genetic data, and you want to identi identify associations. So it's what Michaela said very nicely, you know, it's, it's zero, one, it's dummy variable. So, so I remember asking one of my colleagues, I was so excited, I'm going to enter this new field. And, um, can I look at the data? And you look at it, and it's a whole bunch of dummy, uh, you know, zero one, and you think, oh, it's, uh, yeah, so, so, but it's a massive amounts of data, but you're looking at correlations along the genome, so what I showed you here, zero one with your outcome. So in my, in my case, the, the one that we conducted, one of the ones was age at first birth and number of children ever born. So you look for associations. So the goal is to find an association between your whole genome with your phenotype, which they call it, or our, in our language, outcome or dependent variable. And you look at the statistical association between that. Um, and then what you do is you take the results, and this is what we did, and you turn it over to experts in biology um, and molecular uh, genetics and bioinformatics. Bioinf they take the results, they have a pipeline, I'll show you it in a minute, and they look at what the function is of the genes. So some early social scientists thought they could do that part. <laughs> um, and I would strongly advise against it. I was saying before that um, you know, I got all excited and I was talking to the biologist. And then I called him two months later. Um, and he said, 
oh, oh, that technique. Oh, no, no, that one's uh, so last month. Um, you know, it's uh, uh, so the techniques also just are, are very rapid and you'd never be able to keep up uh, with that, that uh, uh, those kind of rapid techniques. So why do we need it? Um, well, I think what we've realized now is it's never one gene. So um, it's always polygenic, so multiple genetic loci that are predicting behavior. Certainly, um, for some diseases, there are Mendelian diseases, so Huntington's disease, there, there is you know, a gene mutation. But for most complex outcomes that social scientists look at, educational attainment, well-being, depression, neuroticism, you know, age at first birth, all of these things, they're complex or what they call distal, so far away outcomes from biology. So it's usually multiple genes. And there was a great paper that came out a few months ago saying, well, it's probably omnigenic, which means that all of the genes <laughs> might have an influence. So the field moves very quickly. Um, the cost of genotyping has been reduced, um, and we've had an explosion of biosocial data sets. And I was so happy to see Understanding Society presented because it's really one of the gems in, in the sense that it's um, representative and longitudinal, and it's very rare to have that. So for social scientists, that's a treasure trove, <laughs> um, because many of the studies are very selective. So the UK Biobank, for example, has a 5.7% um, uh, uh, response rate, uh, and uh, it's uh, fairly selective. So most of the things that we look at are complex, and I've already talked about this. And I think that there's a lot of gene-environment interaction, which I'll, I'll tell you about. You know, and what we've seen is that it's much easier to genotype data. And if I have some time at the end, I'll tell you about the new citizen science and crowdsourcing approach to this. Because the costs of genotyping individuals has just gone down just rapidly over time. And no one would have expected that. We've also had the rise of direct-to-consumer uh, data and, and, and um, uh, companies that, uh, where you can, like 23andMe and uh, Ancestry DNA, where you can get your own uh, genetic data. So I already talked about these SNPs um, already, but <coughs> I think the most important thing is just to note from this uh, is it's never just one SNP except for these rare diseases. It's a combination and it's polygenic. If, if you can take one thing away from it, it's that. So we conducted a GWAS, and that's um, what we call data mining um, and what the geneticists call hypothesis-free research. Um, so it's, a, it's, just, it's just different uh, approach to it. And you regress on your outcome you know, uh, a million times, all of these different outcomes, and you adjust, of course, for multiple testing. And there's been an explosion in the number of GWAS. So this is just to give you a timeline. Um, so the candidate gene studies I talked about were coming out sort of around here maybe a little bit here, unfortunately, but um, we started to have around 2007 this just explosion of genome-wide studies. So these are these polygenic scores that you can use, and now we're over 3,000, and I'll reflect on those um, uh, later. So let me give you some examples that, that might be relevant for you. Um, there was one um, uh, that I was involved in as well, um, published uh, last year in Nature Genetics, and that uh, produces polygenic scores for depression, uh, well-being, and neuroticism. And it shows the genetic overlaps between some of those traits. So those things you could actually use as polygenic scores, um, and this could be interesting for some of your analyses. This is being replicated at the moment as well in a larger sample, so probably will have more predictive power. The one that m many of you may heard about, and I, I know that Dan Benjamin will be coming and talking about it. He was one of the people involved in this. Um, in uh, science in 2013, they first isolated around six genetic loci that were related to educational attainment. So they looked at how many years of education you have and whether you attend college or not. Some of you may have heard of this. It was replicated again and um, published last June in Nature um, in 2016, um, and they found 74 loci. It's now a new one, <laughs> it's a larger one under review, and they're around 1,300 loci. And I'll show you 
Uh, Dan allowed me to show some of the preliminary results from that as well, too. And this is our study where we um, found 12 loci um, um, uh, related to human reproductive behavior. So timing and number of children you have published in Nature Genetics last October. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that now. So in this study, um, so this is not for the faint of heart. If you get excited and you think, I'm going to conduct a, a GWAS after you leave, um, it's a huge uh, amount of work, not just in terms of the mass of data, but in terms of the communication uh, between people, but also just trying to get all of these different data sets together, analyzing them. Um, it's, it's not a glamorous thing because a lot of it is emailing. Um, <laughs> You know, to try to get the data, and you said you deliver it, and you didn't deliver it, and you know, and uh, yeah, so it's it's a lot of that. Um, but we realized that in order to get a large sample, and we're one of the out of the three thousand studies, we're one of the top ten of the largest uh, uh, genome wide. It wasn't our goal; we just realized this later. Um, we were one of the top ten um, uh, largest studies. Um, and we got it, our data from medical companies, uh, uh, medical studies, insurance, uh, direct-to-consumer companies, and we can talk about that later if you have questions. Um, but what's interesting is that we have a lot of men. And anyone that's examined uh, uh, things in relation to children and in relation to fertility, you'll know that in many surveys, they don't even ask men about fertility. Um, so, and you know, and the, the excuses are that uh, they don't know how many children they have for sure, and, and <laughs> you know, and these kind, of, uh, these kind of questions, but, um, um, you know, so we were really, really excited. Um, yeah, oh, we've got a man in the back, yeah, yeah. <laughs> ask about the, what the, maybe others are not quite clear as well, so the, 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 what you're doing is you're finding lots and lots of studies that have been done, set data sets that have been put together, yeah. that have the same Yes. Uh, and the, the, the genome turns into these SNP binary indicators. And you sort of com combine them yeah. and, and that gives you more kind of power to that's exactly. So I'll just repeat in case you. So, so what we do is, is what you need to locate is data that has genetic data, but also has your outcome variables. So education in years, and in our case, the age at first birth and number of children ever born. And actually, that's often collected as basic demographic control. So uh, for our data, there was actually quite a quite, quite a high availability. You combine all of those together, um, and you produce what's called a meta analysis. So everyone does their separate analyses, and sometimes we do them ourselves. You combine all of their results together in a meta-analysis, and then you produce what I'm about to show you, these sort of genetic loci that you've located. So that's how it's done, with a lot of emailing in between. <laughs> so what we found um, um, for age at first birth, we found 10 significant loci, and I'll, I'll, maybe I'll describe these uh, plots first. These are called Manhattan plots, because they sort of look like the skyline of Manhattan. Um, or we could call, rename them Oxford plots, but uh, with the spires. But, um, but um, this is age at first birth, and this is number of children ever born. These are the chromosomes, and these there are the ones that have hit a significance level. So uh, this level of minus 6 means that it's suggestive. And if it's above this line to the p to the 10 to the minus 8, then it means that you have a significant finding in a hit. And I'm sorry it's so small. Um, and you'll see that uh, estrogen comes up a lot. That's why I was asking you. It's one of, it comes up in most studies uh, in, in genetics. Um, um, so what you'll see is we found all of these different uh, loci, but what was interesting, we found, found some only in men and some only in women. And then we turn, and don't worry, I'm not going to go through all of these, um, but we turned it over then to the biologists, the bioinformatics people, and the molecular geneticists to figure out, okay, so what are these genes doing? <laughs> you know, what's their, are, are they doing anything causal? Are they related to methylation? So we heard about uh, epigenetics uh, previously. Um, you know, what's been found about them before? Um, how, how do they relate in terms of a network, um, in terms of their um, uh, similar functions? And indeed, um, some of the more interesting findings were related to men. So it looks like 
men might have something to do with fertility. Um, so, uh, um, and they might have something to do with infertility, and, and I'll return to that in a moment. Um, so things were found in related to sperm quality, sperm production, which was really, really quite interesting and hadn't, hadn't been seen um, before. Um, it was related to some findings found in uh, mouse models, but also in relation to hormones, um, in relation to estrogen, and follicle stimulating hormones and hormones related to development. So that makes sense when we think about fertility. But also it was related with some overlaps for infertility um, factors found for endometriosis and polycystic ovarian syndrome that are known uh, causes of infertility in women. So we clearly had found something with our behavioral outcomes. We had found some sort of biological things that uh, hadn't been found before. And something that we're following up now in another study um, was that the lead uh, loci on chromosome 3 was linked to the methylation and expression of genes um, in relation to sperm function and sperm count and quality. So this was really um, exciting to, to find some things related to older men and uh, um, uh, mutations, but also uh, genetic expression. So this will be coming out. We're finalizing it now in our different analysis centers. So, so look for it <laughs> in a probably Nature Genetics or <laughs> you know, uh, uh, some, some, hopefully, um, some uh, a similar type journal where we again look at these things. But we also look at childlessness. And we also look at age at first sex. So this is crazy. But if you look at the literature, there's virtually no, very few studies that connect sex and fertility. And we're, we're thinking also that they, there might be a link. Um, so, um, so that was another hunch that we decided to explore. Um, and, uh, uh, and this is really interesting. I'm not going to show you the results today. But this one also has overlaps with risk, not only development, but risk behavior as well. So it's really got some really interesting uh, findings. And that's, uh, that will be coming out soon. So we imputed it on uh, more dense data, which gives us better resolution. And, and, and we're looking also at the X chromosome. So our new coverage um, is almost up to a million for some of the outcomes. Um, and uh, this is age at first birth, age at first sex. We actually have a reasonable sample for age at first sex, childlessness, and number of children ever born. So you can look for that coming to a study near you. And then we produce the polygenetic uh, scores. And we can, you can add them into, uh, you know, like understanding society and all of the different data sets. So if you want to include that as a variable in your model, a control variable, you're able to do that and see, okay, I'm looking at a fertility model um, um, or age at first sex, or I want to look at smoking and I want to look at risk. You can use then these genetic variables as controls or as interactions. So what we do from these genetic-wide studies is we produce what's called polygenic scores. So these are um, um, looking, it's a weighted average, and I think you should think about it in terms of, and it, it's easier if you see the math, but it's, um, it's just a single quantitative measure of genetic risk. So your genetic propensity to have higher years of education or lower, or to have your child later, or to have more children. Think about it like that. And I'll now show you some results using these polygenic scores. So from the Nature, the old Nature article <laughs> um, last June, they were saying that once you include all of the SNPs and weight them, if you include this polygenic score for education in years, um, you'll have a predictive power about, of about 6%, just alone. So it'll it will predict around 6% of educational attainment in uh, white European populations, and I'll come back to this in a moment, uh, <laughs> too. And the new study that uh, should be coming out soon is incredible in uh, the sense that they're now up to predicting, and this is in Ad Health in the Wisconsin Longitudinal Survey, they predict about, you know, maybe 10 or 11 percent of, uh, you know, uh, their polygenic score for years of education. And if we compare it in relation to our usual suspects that we usually include in our models, so things like your parents' education, your dad and mom's education, your cognitive ability, it has a fairly high predictive power. So we have maybe been ignoring <laughs> uh, some important factors. 
So we wanted to see what the predictive power was of our genetic scores. So we uh, looked at it in um, all of these different countries and cohorts. And I'll speed up a bit so I can tell you about why I think uh, it's interesting to look across countries and cohorts. So what we found is our age at first birth score actually explains around 1% of the variance. So do you remember I told you before that the, uh, uh, you saw before that, that, that from the SNP heritability, from the Grimal methods, we were about at 15%. When we actually, and this happens with all of the genetic studies when you get where complex behavior, you get what's called the missing heritability problem. We actually were able to predict around 1%. I'll return back to why this could be the case in a minute. But if you just enter one variable into a model, you'll see that social science variables, if you just uh, don't take a multivariate approach, they'll predict around 6% or 10%. So it isn't as dramatic as you think. You can think about it as one standard deviation uh, uh, variation, our polygenic score is related to a postponement of around six months for women and around four months for men. It gets a bit trickier to think about the um, effect sizes of polygenic scores for number of children ever born. We haven't been able to visualize it. So I've done it on my son. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, it predicts around 0 0.04 of a child. Um, it's hard to describe this effect size, but uh, I'll show you in a moment um, how you could use it in a model where it will make more sense. So another thing we wanted to look at, we wanted to see are the polygenic scores that we looked at, are they associated with um, other fertility traits? Or other, tra not just fertility traits, but you know, all sorts of other kind of traits. So what do you think that timing of when you have your child and number of children ever born, what other traits or outcomes could it be associated with? What do you think? Psychological traits or what? Yeah? Income. Income. So what do you think? It's my interactive moment. <laughs> <laughs> I learned it from Mikel. I thought, oh, that's a good idea. <laughs> uh, sexuality? Sexuality. So we can come back to that question. That'll be an interesting one after. Has there been a GWAS done on sexuality? No. Um, we'll come back to that after. Okay, let me, let me ruin the surprise. You can't see it anyway, so I'll have to tell you. Um, this is the genetic correlation of 27 different genome-wide association searches that were done and how they correlate with our age at first birth and number of children ever born. Red is age at first birth. Blue is number of children ever born. If it has a star, it's significant. This shows your genetic correlation, lower or higher. This shows the 27 different traits. I'm just going to talk about one set of traits. I can't go through all of them. Don't worry. Um, and it's things uh, related to development, uh, uh, um, related to lifestyle, related to um, you know, the big five, Alzheimer's, subjective well-being, um, and related to some health and um, height and BMI, those factors. So what we found was really interesting is that there's a a strong correlation and a link between what we found with human development. And it's fertility, so it actually kind of makes sense, right? So um, we did something called LD score regression, and you can look up some, or I can send you some of the, re the uh, references if you're interested. But what we found was there was a very strong link, a correlation of, uh, you know, almost over 0.7 with age at first birth and age at first sexual intercourse. So this can be related to development. Also um, um, related to age at menarche and age at menopause. And for boys, it's hard to get a measure, but um, there was a significant relationship with voice breaking in boys. So the genetic studies that had been done there. So it shows some sort of relationship uh, in terms of uh, human development. But then what we also thought, wait a minute, there's a group of individuals who seem to have a shifting of their entire um, reproductive period to have later menarche, later um, age at first sex, later age at first birth, also later age at menopause. So then we thought, okay, it would be interesting to see if it's linked with longevity. Did these people, and it, w we're following up with epigenetic studies too, is it, you know, are there these people that have, um, uh, that, that live longer, that have this genetic profile? 
but somebody else did it first. Uh, <laughs> and here's the results. Uh, um, one of our co-authors, even. Um, um, but it's, it's all nice. It's published in Plus Biology now. And what they found, they used our age at first birth uh, polygenic score, and they found they related it to mother's age at death. So um, you'd have to make the jump and the assumption that death is <laughs> uh, uh, um, has intergenerational transmission, but uh, still uh, um, it's some interesting results. So it appears to be that we have a shifting for some people, and that's really interesting in terms of um, the way we think about fertility and the life course. So our polygenic score for number of children ever born, what does it do? Well, if you include it in a model, actually if you have a higher propensity to, uh, you have a higher polygenic score for having more children, it decreases the, the probability that you'll remain childless for women. So it does have some predictive power in models. We also started thinking about what's called sexual dimorphism. And this was just published earlier this year. And I'm sure some of you, you can be honest, who's been thinking how on earth is it possible that infertility and childlessness can be transmitted? Right? You've been, some of you have been thinking of that. Because <laughs> um, by nature, if I'm infertile, how could I pass it on to my children? Right? <laughs> so uh, this is the question somebody puts up. You know, so I get that question so often that I thought, OK, let's, let's do an article. Um, so we, we uh, published this in the European Journal of Human Genetics. And it looks as though it's related to what's called sexual dimorphism. And you can look at this um, in more detail if, you, if you're interested. So basically, what we're seeing is genes um, that are related to male childlessness seem to be passed on via the um, male lineage and vice versa for women. So they, they are just passed down and they, they uh, uh, skip a generation. And if you're interested, you can look more um, at that study. But basically, what we wanted to look at, and I'm just going to go a quick bit faster, is it appears that there seems to be different sets of genes implicated for, for men and women. And I think as sociologists or social scientists, you must sort of think, yeah, of course, it's biology and fertility. Uh, they must be different sets of genes. But often the studies are combined for men and women. So we got the question, why are you dividing men and women? <laughs> you know, and uh, um, it's really interesting. Um, so we come in with a very, and I'll show you, a very different perspective onto this data because we just think, yeah, OK, there's differences. We know there's differences um, here as well, too. So, so we showed that. So if we use our polygenic scores, and I'll just give the example of childlessness, but we have other studies we're working on too. Um, so how good are they as predictors when you include other social factors? So I um, showed you the, the, the results when they were alone. So we looked at it um, using the health and retirement um, study, and then we replicated it on the Wisconsin longitudinal study. We can replicate it on understanding society too, but. Um, and we wanted to see what's the probability that you remain childless. And we related it to different causes um, of social science causes, usual suspects that we know, but also infertility. So just to see if you're awake, do you remember some of the infertility? Uh, or what do you think for men and women? What are some of the genetic factors that could predict infertility? Faulty sperm. Faulty sperm, yeah. Yep, the polycystic ovarian syndrome, endometriosis. endometriosis. So we wanted to see, okay, if we look at these different factors, you know, what, how does our, how does our um, uh, polygenic score relate to these other factors? And this is hopefully coming out soon in social science and medicine. So we know that from infertility, you know, we know that there's um, some, some genetic wide association searches that have found things for endometriosis and polycystic ovarian syndrome. But we also know, and this is examined uh, less often, um, but um, that it's related to male sperm quality, um, but also um, with individuals that have had chlamydia. So there's uh, some mutation, and particularly it has effects for older men. So we included our polygenic scores. We included some of these scores that we could get from individuals for male genetic male infertility and some of the female ones. So this is genetics all here, and we include that in the model. I won't show you all the models, don't worry. Um, and then we include the usual suspects <laughs> in sociological research. So things related to, you know, if you have a partner or not, educational attainment, occupation, birth year. 
and it's really small, but um, this is just showing it for a health and retirement uh, survey, but it replicates exactly almost on the Wisconsin longitudinal study. What we found is education is important for whether you remain childless. For men, this is for uh, women, this is for men. So education is really our predictor. So if you stay in education longer, you have a higher probability of remaining childless for, you know, so all the stuff I did for 20 years wasn't exactly wrong. <laughs> you know, work-life reconciliation, motherhood penalty, uh, gender equality, all of these aspects are, are still here. Um, but we see that actually um, the age at first birth uh, polygenic score remains significant when all of these social factors are added. And the same holds for men, but uh, for men it seems that this low sperm count is really, really an important predictor of childlessness. And now I'm working on a two-stage model because it's actually selection into partnership as well, too, that's really important. Okay, so I've talked about, um, you know, the relationship with social sciences, but one thing I didn't think about when I entered into this was how important we would be <laughs> for, so I was thinking how important they would be for my research, but it never dawned on me, and I don't have an inferiority complex or anything, but it was just, you know, that we actually have quite a bit uh, to offer to the field of molecular genetics. And that's what I'm starting to realize, and I hope I can bring some of you over to, to help me, um, because I think we have so much to offer. We think about things, as I showed you before, we think about the social context and the environment, and we measure it in just excellent uh, ways. Um, we focus a lot on attentions to group differences, socioeconomic status, um, sex differences, gender differences, and ethnicity. And that's something that's uh, missing, um, not in all of it, but in a lot of this research. So it's very blanket. So this is uh, showing from twin studies, and it's an eye test, I see. Um, it's showing age at first birth and number of children ever born um, and the heritability from twin studies. So we did a review and we wanted to see, you know, what's the heritability? This was before we did the genetic-wide uh, association search. We see that there's uh, uh, heritability. This is different countries and different cohorts. So what do you see when you look at this? even though you can't see it. I've kind of, you, if you can remember what I told you it was. This is different cohorts and countries, and this is the level of heritability. Yeah, there's differences across countries, right? There's also differences across cohorts, and there's differences by men and women. And I mean, this is the social scientist in me thinking, wait a minute, <laughs> you know, there's all of these differences. So you, know, you see this huge variation in heritability, and heritability is a population-specific trait. So, so you know, it's, it's estimated within population. So there should be some variance, but it really differs by country and cohort. There's virtually no studies of men. I've said that before. So that was something that really bothered us, because we were combining 60 or more data sets together uh, across cohorts, across different, uh, uh, they grew up across different periods in different countries, and we were thinking, can we do this? Um, we wouldn't do it in social sciences, but can we do this? <laughs> you know, and that was something we kept asking. Everybody was like, why are you, why do you keep asking that? Um, <laughs> so, you know, and I've I've shown you this before. It's a uh, I this is birth year. This is uh, a women's mean age at first birth. This is the famous U curve. I keep showing you. Sorry for the repetition. Um, these are different countries, but you'll see, you know, that there's quite some variation in the age at first birth across these countries. And if you're born in 1940 and you're born in 1980, you know, you have a different social context and a different age at first birth, as, does your, as do your peers. So, oh yes, and here's an example. This is my mom. Hi, mom, if you're watching. <laughs> um, and uh, this is her mother-in-law, and this is uh, her grandmother. And this is me. Um, you can see that uh, myopic or myopia and eyeglasses is heritable um, from this uh, thing. But what you'll also see, this is her um, with her first child, and this is me. And 
I just wanted to show you the differences in, you know, you can actually just see it in this picture of when she decided to have her children. Look at the social control in the room. Mm -hmm. Look at me. I don't know. I'm out on the street somewhere holding a baby. Um, <laughs> you know, the, the differences are, are dramatic. So she had her children in Canada and I had mine in the Netherlands. So it's really just a very different um, social environment and very different levels of social controls. So the genes that are related to her having a baby might be different than the genes related to me having a baby, right? Mm -hmm. So that's what we thought <laughs> as social scientists. And we had many years of rejection, um, but now last month we got the cover of Nature Human Behavior where we actually explore this, <laughs> you know? And, uh, and, and uh, you know, this was years of trying to, to, to show these effects. So we're arguing that when you combine all of these data sets together, you might be missing a lot of uh, heterogeneity, so differences across birth cohorts and populations. And it's all social scientists, and you're thinking, yeah, of course, but this really hadn't been discussed. So this meta-analysis and all of these things I was showing you, it just lumps everything together, and it kept bothering us, <laughs> you know, uh, that we were doing it. So we wanted to see, um, you know, this, remember I showed you the, uh, heritability estimates from Grimal, they were 15%, they were but when we got to GWAS, they were 1%. We wanted to see, well, could that be, you know, the, the difference, that we're just sort of missing something, something's hidden because of this heterogeneity. So we estimate it using real data from multiple data sets, and then we engage in a series of very detailed simulations. It's going through different matrices across populations and countries. And if you're interested, you can look into our fascinating supplementary material that includes all of the mathematics, but also um, the information on the simulations. I'm not going to talk about that here. We looked at education, age at first birth, number of children ever born, BMI, and height. We wanted to see if you just look at genetics, but you add cohort, or the country they come from, or the interaction between the three, how much do you explain? So what do you see? Well, this is height. It looks like a lot of it ex is explained by genetic factors. But what's happening over here? It looks like, and that's the non-blue, that the cohort you're in, or the country you're in, is actually seems to be explaining more um, of the variability and the variance. So we're arguing that it was hidden. And we show for each of the phenotypes that for things such as number of children ever born, actually, you know, a lot of the things, um, by combining this, uh, all of these multiple data sets, you've been missing the importance of cohort and country. And you can go into that uh, article if you're interested. But, um, you know, and in for some of these things such as height or some of the harder medical outcomes, you might not be missing anything by not considering environment. So it's a plea to think about, and this is just really simple, right? Cohort <laughs> country. You can think about other things, socioeconomic things, but you know, there's more going on here, and that's why I think it's important for social scientists to just question very basic aspects of these types of analyses. <coughs> so just to give you an example, and Mikhail has already introduced it already, um, so it's perfect. Um, so we often think also about socioeconomic differences. So we wanted to know um, if you're living in a poor neighborhood, but you have a really high genetic disposition to have a high education, you know, what, does that influence you or not? And this is actually an old idea and people have looked at it before. Um, we know that in, in poor families, actually, the genetic component in twin models was almost zero. So and this has been a study that's been replicated for many things. So if you come from a poor environment, um, you know, uh, you might have a high uh, cognitive ability or a high genetic ability, but that might, might not be realized. Conversely, if you come from a high socioeconomic uh, um, environment, other things might not be suppressed or realized. So the example that's already always given is, is genes related to regression and uh, self-control. So if you come from a low socioeconomic environment and you express you know, uh, uh, these sort of aggressive or lack of self-control, you may get put into prison. If you come from a high socioeconomic environment, you could become a politician or a CEO <laughs> um, with the same sort of traits. So that just gives you uh, uh, an example. 
So children growing up in poor environments often face isolation in terms of adult role models, um, disorganization, there's lower social control and monitoring of their homework. Um, they might be in areas of low quality schools. We've seen this, this white flight or you know, uh, going around in catchment areas um, that have higher school qualities and people can't afford to live in those areas. And um, as was discussed before, environmental impact. So there might be a lot of noise um, or something that influences the children when they're, when they're trying to study. So we look at it in an American data set. It's longitudinal um, using ad health data. And we wanted to see if you have this higher or lower propensity, genetic propensity for education in years, does it matter uh, the environment you grow up in? We looked at different census blocks and we did a principal component analysis on neighborhood quality. Um, I won't go into that in detail, but um, uh, we looked at it at wave one, so when they're about 10 or 11 years old. So if you grow up in an impoverished or a high status neighborhood um, when you're 10 or 11, what is your education when you're 24 to 32? So do you have a higher education or have you attended college? We run various regression models, but I'm not going to go into those now. We can, we can talk about them later if you're interested. And this was kind of amazing <laughs> when we saw it. Um, this is a polygenic score, and this is uh, the prediction. These are the high socioeconomic, uh, the children that grew up in a high socioeconomic neighborhood, and these are the kids that grow up in a low socioeconomic neighborhood. This is your polygenic score from lowest to highest sort of uh, genetic propensity to have a higher education in years. So what do you see? Yeah, you see an interaction, that's for sure. And you were going to say something too? Uh, I was just talking about like, the social inequality and the uh, angle. So social inequality, and uh, you know, I, I'm a social scientist, so. But um, look at this. If, you're, if you have a higher, so these two groups both have a high, and it, this has a high correlation with cognitive scores, right? So, so these two groups. Um, have a very high cognitive score. These ones come from poor environments. These ones come from um, uh, wealthy environments. Don't tweet it, though, because it's not published yet. Um, <laughs> but it's under review. Um, but, uh, but uh, you know, you can just really see that these ones are able to realize their genetic pr pr uh, potential. And this is why when Patrick asked about these groups that divide up uh, racial differences, so-called racial differences, they're usually picking up a lot of socioeconomic differences um, that aren't related to ethnicity um, or race at all. So we wanted to think about it. Is it probably this whole environmental thing and is it the educational aspirations of parents? So the higher socioeconomic parents probably want their kids to go on to uh, higher education. And indeed, um, the, the question, how disappointed would you be if your son or daughter did not graduate from college, um, predicting um, this uh, uh, polygenic score. So you see that these ones are more realistic, maybe, <laughs> about their low cognitive children, that they won't be disappointed. Um, but these, this is flat. So there's, you know, even though this is a really, really, these are really, really bright children on the very right end of the, you know, uh, spectrum here. The, really bright, but there's, you know, um, so this, this is really interesting in terms of uh, social uh, aspects. Okay, now the elephant in the room. Everything I've been showing you so far is about white people, almost all of it. So um, there's an article um, last year in Nature that shows, um, and you can't see it here, in 2009, 96 of the genetic studies of these 3,000 I was talking to you about um, is on people of European ancestry, white European ancestry. And 81% in 2016. I'll show you something else in a minute. Um, so, and then this is uh, Asian populations. Largely, there's been some large Chinese and Han Chinese studies, mostly there. Very few studies, this is African ancestry, very few studies of African ancestry and other groups. 
What's going on? It's probably the engineers on building the technology, are they, to work with different ethnic groups? So there's, there's something related to the population stratification and the structure of the data. So there's a technical aspect here related to minor and major alleles. Um, funding. So I'll tell you, there's a, we have a, a paper hopefully coming out soon. A, we call it the conspiracy theory paper. But um, it's uh, you know, something coming out where we actually analyze all of these studies. We analyze the authors of these studies. We analyze where they're funded. We look at their gender. We look at different aspects, and we look at the different outcomes. <coughs> and this isn't published, but this is something we're working on. And if you look at, over time, all of these different studies, uh, blue is European ancestry. Uh, red is um, Asian, and then we find very small um, anything else looking at these genetic studies. Um, and what we found is actually a turn back with the UK Biobank to looking into more, so back up to 95% of looking at these studies. And so why is this important? It's important because um, drug targets <laughs> and many sort of medical developments are being developed based on these and they might not be as useful for other populations or as relevant. So um, if you're interested, we're working on a paper right now related to this and we look at the authors and their networks and the different data sets across time and the different sort of groups that are examined because I think this is really something as a social scientist you come in and you think, <gasps> yeah, so we can discuss that later if you, if you like. Um, so can we ignore it? Um, I guess just to summarize, I think there's a lot of non-replicated uh, gene studies um, that you can ignore. And I think you can get excited about some of these results. But as I showed you, it's still, some of the things are not all biological and they might not have a high predictive power. And I think, you know, our social science predictors are actually pretty good. <laughs> um, so a lot of the things that we've been used to predict inequality and outcomes are actually very good predictors. But it's when, and I tried to show you with that neighborhood example, it's when you do the interaction that you see, wait a minute, you know, there's some people, and think about it related to disease, I showed it in relation to education, there's some people not realizing their potential or having things triggered, genetic predispositions triggered that, that are detrimental. So I think it's really interesting because it really challenges us to think in a different way. I know that in social sciences where I've worked in until now, everything's in terms of choice and agency and structure. But what if you throw the genetic <laughs> component in there? How does that challenge our theory? So there's a lot of work for theorists here. Um, but also I think we'll probably produce some new methods and findings. So for that, uh, looking at uh, these Grimal methods across country and cohort, the the R package just didn't have anything. It does now. <laughs> but it didn't have anything that could do that. So we had to do all of our matrix algebra and, 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 and calculate that ourselves. But I think we have something to offer, too, in terms of developing new models and pathways. Um, I think it's really exciting about all the different polygenic scores. So the one for educational attainment, well-being, neuroticism, those, all those traits I, I showed you, um, people make them available. It's part of the condition, some of them faster than others. Um, but we uh, published ours, for example, the day of the publication. So you could get all of our results, make it all open. And I think it's really exciting to think about gene environment interaction. And it's a, it's a good moment for the social sciences, because I think we have a lot to say um, in, this, in this field. So what happens if we ignore all of this? <laughs> um, and we think, OK, let's, let's, let's not you know, combine social sciences and molecular genetics. I tried to find the most suspicious looking lab technician I could. He does look a little sneaky. I don't know if you can see it. But, um, you know, if we don't bring in the right measures, because I've seen studies where they say, oh, no, socioeconomic status doesn't matter. And then you go and you look at it and you think, well, that's not measured properly, you know? Um, so I think we have very good expert um, uh, measurement. And I think we're, just as they're better at measuring um, lab things and, 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 and different genetic aspects, we're experts at measurement. And I think we often forget the strengths of uh, our own field. So um, I think we can 
um, you know, introduce very good measures. I think we're the masters of measurement. I've said this already. Um, but I think there's some really, and maybe we'll have time to talk about it in the panel, there's some really interesting policy and ethical issues <laughs> about everything I've talked about today um, and, and, you know, what was discussed before. So what are the policy implications of this? And Jason Fletcher did a really interesting study, if you're interested. Um, he looked at something in the U.S. that happened in relation to tobacco control. So what happened in the U.S., but it happened also in many, many countries in Europe, um, where they, tack they put high taxation on tobacco and they limited smoking in public places. And what he found was the people that had, um, that were just sort of, they had the nicotine uh, uh, addiction. So they had the, gene the polygenic scores related to high addiction to nicotine. No matter what you did to them, they were going to smoke. <laughs> um, but the other ones, that, those policies worked. So uh, the people, the social smokers, or the people that, you know, just weren't hardwired to be addictive to smoking, that actually worked for them. So that's interesting in thinking about, you know, we might wa wa want to have these 80s or 90s, 1990s kind of policies that blankets everybody, but we want, might want to have tailored policies. So for these people that are really addicted to smoking, you might want to think of pharmaceutical patches or something for them, because no matter how much you tax them, <laughs> um, you know, or forbid them, they, they will have difficulties in stopping. So I'm not convinced it's going to overturn uh, everything we know but I think it will complement um, our substantive findings. So that's it. So thank you very much. <laughs>